And now on BBC Radio 3 with the time at half past nine, the second part of our series, Caucasian Roots. The historian Bethany Hughes continuing her exploration on the influence of the Caucasus on the Western imagination. Tonight, she investigates why white people are called Caucasian. The Alps we already knew, and the Pyrenees, but this was finer than anything we had ever seen or even imagined in our wildest dreams. This was the Caucasus. The Caucasus, that fertile, mountain-rich isthmus of land between the Caspian and the Black Seas, has, for thousands of years, been a nexus for game-changing histories and, critically, for universal stories. Stories that try to explain who we are both as individuals and as a species. Medea, Prometheus, even the Garden of Eden have all claimed this place as home. I've long been drawn to the region because in some ways this is my homeland too. Curiously, if you think about it, Along with millions of others around the world, I'm regularly offered the chance to describe myself, medically, as being white Caucasian. But if you use the word in Russia, Caucasian means pretty much the polar opposite. Kavkazi, Caucasian, implies someone with darker skin. It's a derogatory, fearful term used to define and to denigrate outsiders. Such a paradox is typical of Caucasian affairs, a place that attracts and repels with equal force, that has to be imagined to be understood. So in the second part of this series, as the region races up the political agenda I'm investigating how the writers and thinkers of the 18th, 19th and 20th centuries crafted their own visions of the Caucasus so they could measure themselves and their world against their creation, giving us a landscape that has become an intimate part of our own story. To begin my journey, I took the long trip south from the Black Sea to a mountain that is as much symbol as material fact. Mount Ararat, a quadrupoint between Iran, Turkey, Armenia and Azerbaijan. This is the place where, we're told, Noah's Ark came to rest, where viticulture began and where human civilization, as we know it, took root. And Noah began to be an husbandman and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine, and was drunken. I was looking forward to seeing Ararat's famous silhouette, but things didn't turn out quite as I expected. So we can't actually see Mount Ararat, can we? There is no little irony in play here today because I have travelled for many days on pretty perilous roads to come to see Mount Ararat and I can only just about make it out because it's veiled in a cloud of smog and fog. That said, it does still draw your eye on these flat Anatolian highlands. It's 5,000 metres at the peak and it feels magnetic. Your, your eye is absolutely compelled towards it. Ever since Marco Polo popularised this mountain destination as the biblical Ararat in the 13th century, the region grew in the West's imagination as a spiritual and physical homeland. It's this tradition that lies at the root of the Enlightenment identification of white people as Caucasian. Nell Painter of Princeton University. The scholar who gave the name Caucasian to white people 
was a man named Jan Friedrich Blumenbach, who lived a very long life in the 18th and early 19th century. He died in 1840. The term may have floated around some before then, but it was Blumenbach who uh, is the person who cemented the name for the people he said were between Western Europe, well into Russia, over to the Indus uh, in India, and including North Africa. So it was a very large region. Often described as the father of physical anthropology, a passionate craniologist, Johann Friedrich Blumenbach lived and worked in the university town of Göttingen in central Germany. In 1795, he published a new edition of his most famous work, On the Natural Varieties of Mankind. In it, he offered a five-part classification of the varieties of the human species, using his extensive collection of skulls from around the world. He set out a diagram of the key skulls, The central example, you sense, is the one that he cares most about. Caucasian variety. I have taken the name of this variety from Mount Caucasus, both because its neighbourhood, and especially its southern slope, produces the most beautiful race of men, I mean the Georgian, and because all physiological reasons converge to this, that in that region, if anywhere, it seems we ought with the greatest probability to place the autochthonies the original peoples of mankind. I'm on the flat grey plains beneath Mount Ararat, looking at a pen and ink drawing that demonstrates Blumenbach's dangerously neat fantasy about the origins of the human race. Uh, There are five skulls in front of me. At either extreme, you have the Mongolians and the Ethiopians. And in the centre, a sort of golden mean, is the Caucasian skull, which he believed to be the most perfect, the ideal white European. Looking at this, I have to say, is a very sobering experience standing here because Blumenbach's work is an insult both to the subtlety of the stories that came from this region and the rigour of honest archaeology. But it is a nonsense that we need to care about because the charisma of his theory is the principal reason that at some point many millions in the West have ticked that box on a medical form marked white Caucasian. We might forgive Blumenbach's religiously biased rationale, typical of its age, that since this was the resting place of Noah, the Caucasus should be credited as a seedbed of humanity. But in fact, this is a trope we see repeated again and again when it comes to the Caucasus. A fabricated tale inspired by archaeological or anthropological reality that at once etiolates the homeland and lionises those observing from the outside. And, if anything, Blumenbach's driving logic was even more bizarre. The reason for putting the Caucasian variety of humans at the centre of his system was that they were, he thought, simply the most beautiful. Nell Painter. Beauty turns up over and over again in taxonomy. You can only read the outside of the body. You can measure it, you can look at it, and you can say you like it or you don't. And over and over again, the judgments that lie at the basis of classification are aesthetic ones. Does this person look good to me, me, the scholar? But that doesn't explain why he thought Georgians were the most beautiful. Blumenbach had his Georgian skull, but he'd never actually been to the region. He looked back to a man named Jean Chardin, who had been a merchant, a jewellery merchant, became known as a great traveller, published his account of going through the Caucasus. And he says when he was writing, it was taken for granted that the Georgians were the most beautiful people in the world. The blood of Georgia is the most beautiful in the Orient, And I would have to say in the world, for I've never noticed an ugly face of either sex in this country, and some are downright angelic. Nature has endowed most of the women with graces not to be seen in any other face. I have to say it is impossible to look at them without falling in love with them. 
no more charming faces and no more lovely figures than those of the Georgians could serve to inspire painters. They are tall, graceful, slender and poised, and even though they don't wear many clothes, you never see bulges. The only thing that spoils them is that they wear makeup, and the prettier they are, the more makeup they wear, for they think of makeup as a kind of ornament. So, despite Blumenbach describing the Caucasians as the most beautiful variety of men, at root, he was actually talking about women. A fact amplified when you learn the origins of the skulls in Blumenbach's notorious diagram. Exemplars of a kind of sexualized imperialism. So three of the five skulls were of women, and they were all related to science through sex. The Tahitian would have been a girlfriend or a wife of one of the bounty sailors uh, sent to Tahiti to dig up uh, breadfruit trees to take over to St. Kitts to feed the workers there. The uh, so-called Ethiopian, the provenance, said she was from West Africa and she was supposedly the concubine of a Dutchman. The Dutch uh, did slaving in Cape Coast in what is now Ghana. And then the Georgian woman, who don't have the name, uh, looking at the skull, which has all its teeth, uh, which is not battered, doesn't show signs of wear, so to speak, so it is a young person. We know from the cover letter that came with the skull that it belonged to a Georgian woman taken prisoner and brought back to Moscow who died of venereal disease. That is to say, this young woman was raped to death. It's sobering to realise that an abstract academic study relied so directly on the spoils of colonisation and the slave trade. For centuries, the Caucasus and the Black Sea region had been a source for slaves trafficked from east to west. This was big business for the Venetians, the Genoese, the Ottomans and the Persians. Travellers to the region, from Chardin in the 17th century through to English travel writer and scientist Edward Clarke of the 18th and even the philosopher Immanuel Kant, all focus on sex slavery when writing about the Caucasus. It seems enslavement itself could have enhanced the perceived attraction of Caucasian women. Over and over again, the beautiful Caucasian is a young woman in a group of captives who are about to be sold. That is the scenario, that's the context in which this beautiful figure arises. So Clark says he uh, spoke with a 14-year-old girl who was conscious of her great beauty. But she was afraid that her parents would sell her, he says, according to the custom of the country. And then he goes on to say that um, the Caucasians were very much prized in the harems of the Persians and the Turks. And the idea that these beautiful young women uh, were, were destined to uh, Turkish and Persian harems. This is something that Kant mentions. And he says this in a very stereotypical way that I've come across several times, um, that the men of Persia and, and Turkey and the Ottomans, they're really ugly men, Kant says. So they really need beautifying. <laughs> so this is the line that we uh, encounter several times, including from Kant, but also in Edward Clark. This is the land of slavery, and its purpose is to beautify. I'm looking at a languid and enticing scene. A half-dressed woman, flushed, probably post-coital, with silks and gauzes covering not much, to be honest, is being serenaded by another bare-breasted female slave, while a dark oriental looks on from behind a colourful balustrade. This is Jean-Auguste Dominique Angres, the odalisque with slave, 
painted in 1839. Ingres, like Frederick Leighton and the Scottish painter William Allen, it seems almost couldn't stop themselves painting bevies of beauties in perfectly rendered oriental harems. The image of a tragically beautiful Caucasian woman captive in an Ottoman harem was in fact a bestseller in the 19th century. This intensely erotic figure was known as an odalisque, from the Turkish word odalik for chambermaid. It's soft porn, masquerading as the popular genre painting of the age. So whereas today our attention might be grabbed by news from the northeast Caucasus, with conflicts in territories like Chechnya and Dagestan, in the 19th century it was the northwest Caucasus, and in particular the ethnic group known as Circassians, that were on the international radar. The Circassian resistance to Russian encroachment was written into the narrative of the great game and onto the front pages. Indeed, the name Circassian became a synonym for Caucasian. The Circassian brand quickly went global. Beauty products, face cream, hair dye, lipsticks were all marketed with a Circassian label. Professor Charles King of Georgetown University. Circassians are so well known in this period that in fact the greatest of American showmen, P.T. Barnum, tries to figure out a way to use that image uh, for his own purposes. And in the early 1860s he opens something in New York called the American Dime Museum. We would now call it a, a freak show perhaps, but it was the, a, a major form of entertainment in the United States before the age of cinema. You would go in and see various oddities and strange things from around the world. One of the things that he put on display was a woman named Zoberdia Luti, at least we think that was her name. And you could go into his uh, dime museum, pay your dime, which was considered a relatively high fee for admission at the time. And she would tell you about her journey from the Northwest Caucasus into the harem of an Ottoman official in Istanbul, about her rescue by uh, one of uh, Barnum's associates, her conversion to Christianity, being taught English, and now being brought for your delight and delectation to New York to talk to an American audience and tell them about her very remarkable journey. Now, of course, Zoberdia Luti was probably not named Zoberdia Luti. It's an odd, kind of weirdly orientalized, made-up name. She was probably an Irish girl from the Lower East Side. But she was taken into Barnum's museum and became the image of what came to be called in American popular culture a Circassian beauty with wild hair and vaguely orientalized clothing, uh, speaking miraculously unaccented English in describing uh, her journey from the Caucasus to, uh, to the West. And for the next nearly half century or so, um, every uh, circus sideshow or dime museum in the United States had to have a Circassian beauty. There are hundreds and hundreds of photos of these women uh, taken at the time because uh, people like to trade them, uh, like kind of trading baseball cards or trading cards. Nell Painter. They got billed as the most pure and beautiful examples of the white race. However, the women who were exhibited had what we would see as kind of Angela Davis afros. They had big, puffy hair. So the image of the beautiful Circassian in the United States is someone who would look like a mixed-race woman uh, to American eyes. We can't know what a New Yorker of the 1850s would have made of these supposed paragons of the white race with their excitingly untamed coiffures. Whether it was a reflection of the traditional Caucasian headgear or because of their status as slaves, it still made some sense at a deep cultural level for them to sport their hair like the African slaves common in the US. A potent mix of the known and the exotic. <whistles> Blumenbach might have got it completely wrong, but as it turns out, his wild fabrications about the origins of white humanity in the Caucasus would be almost prophetic, a pre-echo of a to-be-discovered anthropological bombshell. I made my way to a settlement in a place called Dmanisi, close to the Georgian-Armenian border, 
that was first inhabited close on two million years ago. I met archaeologist Tiona Shellier at the site. I mean, this is very strange. It looks like a kind of moonscape. You've got these twisted, tormented, volcanic black rocks here. What exactly did you find? Here we find the Manisi hominid, the place where the first Europeans were found. <gasps> five skulls, five mandibles, and m more than 80 skeletal bones. From, of, from what date is all of this? It's 1.8 million years. But this is pre-Homo sapiens, so this is Homo yeah, much erectus? Much more pre, because it's a time uh, of a, um, Homo erectus when it had no even bifacial technology. Very primitive stone tools, uh, gathering the raw material for napping from the river gorges and from the slope behind the site. But what you're saying rewrites the orthodox story of human evolution and the human because journey. Because before the Manisi findings, uh, all the uh, prehistorians knew that uh, Homo erectus, uh, it's a first uh, species who left Africa, the cradle, and uh, spread uh, towards uh, uh, Europe and Asia just less than one million years ago. So Dvanisi changed everything. Dvanisi changed the time when Erectus made first journey out of Africa and made it almost one million years older and also changed the idea of the uh, Homo erectus itself. It was thought before that Homo erectus had a very sophisticated hand axe tools, but it appeared it could spread in different territories with the very primitive technologies. It is extraordinary to think yeah. of those men and women up here. I mean, because actually up here, we don't have any other sounds of the modern world, just a bit of bird song. Imagine here were saber-toothed cats, hyenas, wolves, bears, uh, giraffes, elephants, rhinos. Imagine those voice noises all together. They've been coming here getting water. Sometimes Homo erectus was uh, uh, hunting. Sometimes it was hunted by the animals. So that's what's happening here. It's a very curious coincidence as well, isn't it? Because we've got this eccentric man in the 19th century who says that, has this Caucasian theory and says that, you know, all white Europeans and those that are white European in the diaspora come from the Caucasus. And almost uh, f for completely the wrong and different reasons, he was actually onto something because you have now discovered this person from 1.8 million years ago. Yes, let's say that's a just coincidence because Homo erectus story, it's a first exodus and modern humans are descendants of the Homo sapiens who also originated in Africa and then it started to leave Africa some 100,000 years ago. So those are two exodus of two different species. So with that German anthropology story, nothing to deal with the Homo erectus here. But let's think that this is a good coincidence mm -hmm. or maybe we will find out. Nobody was thinking, for example, that in the Manisi, someone will find the things which will totally change the idea of uh, human evolution. Yes, but it happened, so. He, he was misguided, he was wrong, he was completely unscientific, but through his fantasies, it's almost as though he stumbled his way to some yeah, kind of meta-truth. Exactly. Of course, there is no real scientific link between the de Manisi discoveries and Blumenbach's theories, but, the archaeological announcement in 2013 did put Georgia on the map. The headlines trumpeted that the first Europeans had been found in the Caucasus. So the telling of the tale did resonate with the earlier intellectual tradition of the region being a primeval homeland. And it also served a very modern political agenda. Describing Homo erectus as European chimed with Georgia's political case for stronger ties with Europe in its effort to escape Russian influence. In terms of raw nature, this is in many ways a Garden of Eden. Today, farmers can pull in three harvests a year. But for centuries, 
For Arabs, Persians, Mongols and Turks, that meant that this was a place to be plundered. And from the late 18th century, Russia enthusiastically took up the role of plunderer-in-chief. With the Russian soldiers came romantics. Men and their ideas travelling along the legendary Georgian military highway, an ancient, treacherous route that traversed the Caucasus Mountains from north to south. It still has its challenges today. I'm walking along the Georgian military highway and I don't know if you can tell that there's total chaos all around me. The lorries have suddenly come across a whole herd of cows being driven down from their winter pastures uh, by the shepherds. I'm just going to get out of the way because I'm also going to get run over here. Uh. The journey down the uh, Georgian military highway uh, became one of the iconic journeys for generation after generation of Russians. Uh, Pushkin took it in the 1820s and thereafter um, anyone uh, who was going to visit this gem of the empire, Georgia, south of the main chain would have to take uh, the Georgian military highway to get there. It was very much like um, taking a stagecoach ride, and people were literally in coaches going, uh, going along it, uh, in the American West. Uh, there was the threat of uh, being attacked by uh, native highlanders, and even by the, by the 1840s or 1850s, when those kinds of attacks were less frequent, the, the, um, uh, the mythology of it, or the fear of being attacked in that way, was part of the thrill uh, of taking the journey. It wasn't just the highway that recalls the American Wild West. Charles King. It was considered to be um, a wild, foreign territory that Russians wrote into their national history in much the same way that Americans wrote the Wild West and the, the, the settling of the West into American history. So the long wars of conquest in the Caucasus from the 18-teens to the 1860s uh, end up being a fundamental component of the way the Russians see their own identity, the way they see themselves and their own history. Uh, the Russian Empire, it's not too much to say, was forged in the wars of conquest in the Caucasus. It gave the Russians so much of what they think of as fundamental to their culture, from the way in which Cossack dance troops um, uh, portray themselves with their long Cherkeska tunics and their fuzzy papaha hats, uh, to the drinking of Armenian brandy, to toasting rituals around a Russian table. These are borrowings uh, from the Caucasus that were fused with with Russian culture throughout the 19th century. It was through the writings of Alexander Pushkin that the Caucasus came to be known to a wider Russian public. Like an embedded journalist, he attached himself to a Russian military unit in the 1820s. His work shaped how the Russians would view what would soon be a spoil of war and Russian territory. I'll never forget its flinty summits, its gushing springs, its parched heathlands, its sultry wastes, that landscape that made such a deep impression on the two of us, where warlike raiders roam the hills and a wild imagination lies in ambush in the empty silence. The prisoner of the Caucasus tells of a young Russian soldier held captive by a Caucasian tribe in the mountains. He falls in love with a local girl who frees him, but as he makes his escape, the beautiful maiden drowns herself in the river. It's about a, a, a captive Russian soldier engaged in the wars of conquest in the Caucasus who is at the same time both attracted to the local culture and abhors it in a way. Um, it is this attraction and repelling feature that the Caucasus seems to have um, uh, is essential to its very identity that, uh, that Pushkin writes into the poem. And the captive of the Caucasus becomes the way in which generation after generation of Russians uh, have approached the Caucasus, uh, that is, through Pushkin's poem. In fact, for a good part of the 19th century, now the Russian military staff would give sections of the poem to soldiers who were going to the Caucasus front to read as a kind of ethnographic primer uh, on the tribal groups and highlanders that they, were, that they were going to be fighting. It's perhaps the only time in which a piece of literature has been used a poem has been used as a kind of counterinsurgency manual. He had renounced society and befriended nature. He had left his home 
and rushed away to distant parts in the cheerful company of freedom or freedom's ghost. Whether he enjoyed a freedom real or imagined, Pushkin travelled through the territory with wide-eyed delight. The Arabs called the Caucasus the land of many languages, Jabal al-Asun, 40 are still spoken here today, and those variegated cultures left behind their mark. For Pushkin, the baths at Tbilisi were a wondrous revelation. I entered a spacious room, and what did I see? More than 50 women, young and old, half and completely naked, sitting or standing, were undressing and dressing on benches arranged along the walls. I hesitated. Come on, come on, the owner told me. It's Tuesday, Women's Day. Don't worry, it doesn't matter. Of course it doesn't matter, I replied. On the contrary. I went there to meet the Georgian historian, Professor Yulon Gagoshidze. At the, at the time uh, in Petersburg, um, the Winter Palace not, uh, didn't have a single bath. And so at the time Pushkin arrives here in Tbilisi and sees citizens uh, go to bath at least once a week and take bath here. So of course he was very much surprised. Pushkin uses this rather lovely phrase, he talks about sultry waters, which has this kind of very evocative ring to it. So, so, so I mean, Professor, do you think that the version of the Caucasus that Pushkin gave the outside world, was that an accurate one? But of course it is subjective, because he described what he saw. He just described his impressions and, I mean, he wasn't getting deep into history or anything. So his impressions were his impressions and he just described them. His impressions are important though because it's how we came to understand it. So it's very interesting that we were almost given the Caucasus through a Pushkin prism. Now you have a chance to just like learn about Georgia firsthand without Pushkin. I have to say this is one of the more surreal experiences of my life to be brought to a private bathing room by a professor to talk about the bathing culture of Georgia. But very interesting because we came here specifically because Pushkin came here and there's a plaque in marble on the outside of the baths saying he was more delighted by this place than anywhere else he'd been on earth. Um, and yet when you talk to someone like the professor about Pushkin's reactions to the place and his ideas about Georgia and the Caucasus in general, you sense almost as an irritation that the native population are actually rather sick of understanding their countryside, their nation, their land through the eyes of others. And he didn't really want to talk about Pushkin's impressions of the place. He wanted to talk about this as a Georgian experience. After Pushkin's death in 1837, the writer Mikhail Lermontov became the most significant literary voice in Russia and nuanced the way that Russians came to understand the land that they were determined to subdue. Lermontov had actually spent time on the front lines in the Caucasus, sent here on military service by Nicholas I. He's more of a realist than the romantic Pushkin. One of his most famous poems, Ntsiri, inverts Pushkin's prisoner narrative. In Lermontov's version, a Caucasian mountain boy is left in a Georgian monastery and brought up as a Russian. As he grows older, it's the Caucasus mountains themselves that reveal his true identity. And through the mist I saw at times how unassailable in snows the Caucasus in glory rose. And from my half-forgotten past, a misty veil was dropped 
at last. I went to the very evocative place the poem is set, a confluence of two rivers overlooked by a sixth-century church and a site of pilgrimage for patriotic Georgians and overseas visitors alike, to meet Giga Zidania, rector of Ilya State University. How did this place move Lermontov? Um, so Lermontov wrote a poem in 1839 called Mtsiri, and in the beginning, um, Lermontov describes this place as the confluence of, uh, of two rivers, um, comparing it to the two sisters together. So, and this is not a contingent metaphor, it's very consistent with the way um, uh, Russian Romanticism in Russian literature perceived Georgia and South Caucasus as something thoroughly feminine. And this will be the theme which we will meet then in the coming uh, literary works by Russian writers. Increasingly in literature, the South Caucasus was seen as feminine, somehow more malleable and in tune with Russian culture because it too was Christian. The tribes on the north side of the Caucasus, in Circassia, Chechnya and Dagestan, were, however, another matter. In North Caucasus, there were Muslim tribes uh, which were representative of male fierce um, forces which were to be fought against and subdued. But even in this case, the perception was by no means um, unambivalent because uh, these forces then could be viewed as something barbarous, as something which destroys the civilization. But on the other hand, many writers have experienced sympathy towards them as, as towards the principle of freedom, of uh, savage nobleness. And neither Pushkin, nor Lermontov, nor Tolstoy are immune to this sympathy uh, towards uh, Caucasian tribes which are fighting against Russian army advancing Russian civilization. For Giga, the ambiguous attitude of Russian writers to the noble savage of the Caucasus also relates to the ambivalent status of Russia in the world. Now, there is another deeper ambiguity because uh, Russians themselves were by no means viewed in Europe or in the West of that time as part of the Western civilization. Uh, by, by the French, for example, they were considered to be barbarians. So they were uh, acting out or playing in this region, Europeans, by subduing uh, something which was more un-European than they were. So um, this was uh, their, their own version of Orientalism. This was their own version of Orient, um, as against which they were feeling part of Europe and part of West. But also by sympathizing with the oppressed, they were acting out their own feelings of not really belonging to the West. So this is a very deep ambivalence, which was of the Russian civilization or culture or politics of the time, which was played out in this region, in this part of the world. But these topics have deeper roots than just 19th century Russia. The fatal feminization of the Caucasus goes right back to accounts of Medea, Circe and the Amazons close on three millennia before Lermontov was writing. This was a place where men were lured and then trapped. The idea of the good prisoner is both current and prehistoric. Giga Zidania. How far do you think these 19th century approaches are Aboriginal, mm -hmm. or, or are they themselves looking back to classical ideas of the region of the Caucasus? I think one could argue that uh, the a place has some kind of a topic which determines uh, how writers will write about it, because as you know, uh, the Prometheus myth was connected with the Caucasus region, with Prometheus uh, as the rebel against gods was chained to Caucasus. Now, this will be exactly the topic which would define 19th century Russian literature on Caucasus, uh, the topic of captivity, of imprisonment and freedom post to it will be defined 
defining motive, for example, Pushkin's Prisoner of Caucasus. Um, for Lermontov's Mtsiri, we have been talking about, but also for Tolstoy's Haji Murat. And then in 20th century, we will have a enormously popular comedy film, which is called The Prisoner Woman of the Caucasus, and which actually replaced the same theme, but in comic key. And this is one of the most popular Soviet films you will actually see. So, yes, this place has essential link with the conflict between freedom and captivity, with the conflict between stifling order of civilization opposed to rebellious freedom. And this has also found its way in politics, in many wars, and many rebellions. And so it's not only a literary topic, but also a political one. The Caucasus has long been a region burdened by its natural blessings. Struggling to come to terms with its topographical fact as a crossroad of continents and a congruence of cultures. After the Soviet collapse, the region atomized into smaller nationalist states. Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan. And now it's further fragmented, as territories like Abkhazia, South Ossetia and Nagorno-Karabakh break away all operating under the shadow of Russian and, indeed, international foreign policy. So do you think, both as a Georgian and as an academic, that Caucasian is an unhelpful label? Um, at this precise point, I think politically it's very problematic because it links together regions and countries which are moving in different directions. And there are countries which would like to become part of Europe, and then considering them as Caucasian, which mean lumping them together with other countries or regions which actually don't have any intentions to do the same. But perhaps the taint of Russian and Western imperialism that lingers in the word Caucasus can be rehabilitated. Instead, already an ill-understood household name, Caucasian could become a byword for a region that matches the might of its mountains with a bigness of heart that stretches beyond the strife produced by competing cultures and nationalities, stories and histories. Charles King. The irony and in a way the tragedy of the Caucasus today is that it is a unified geographical and even a kind of cultural space. But no one can quite bring himself to say it. The power of national identity, the power of nationalism has been so strong over uh, the last century or so, it has now led to the creation of independent states in the region, that we look back on history and think of the history of this region as being neatly divided into Georgian history or Azerbaijani history or, uh, or Armenian history or Russian history. But that's never been the case in the region. These histories are interconnected. There are silent histories that don't get told in this cacophony of nationalisms in the region. And I think it's very important for people in the Caucasus itself and for people who look at it from the outside to try to look beyond the power of ethnicity and nationality for a moment and to remember a time when you could travel across the mountains or paddle down the rivers and still believe that you were in one magnificent place that everybody from antiquity forward has called some version of Caucasus. Caucasian Roots was presented by Bethany Hughes and produced by Russell Finch. It was a Something Else production for BBC Radio 3, first broadcast earlier this year.